Hey, everybody. Welcome to a new week of the Brain Warriors Way podcast. We are diving deeply into the dragons from the past. In my new book, Your Brain is Always Listening, we have talked about the abandoned, invisible, and insignificant dragons, my primary dragon. We also talked about the inferior and flawed dragon that is driving the epidemic of teenage suicide. And today we're going to talk about the most common dragon of all of them. It's the anxious. Especially right now. Dragon that is breathing fire on your emotional Mm. brain. And it's always been the most common dragon, I think, as humans. Right now, they're having babies. Like, lots and lots of babies. (laughs) Because right now, 2020 was just epic for for the little anxious dragons. Oh, no question. Well, people were... They had a baby boom. At home, they had more time. (laughs) For a baby boom. (laughs) Um, And the anxious dragon is born whenever you felt the world was dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so anxiety is actually written in our genetic code Mm -hmm. because as humans, when we evolved, it was during a time of scarcity. And when, as a species, we're not strong, we're actually pretty weak as a species, but we're smart. But part of being smart is having enough anxiety Mm -hmm. that you save for the future, that you don't go up against a lion directly, that you get a herd and then you develop tools and then walls and right. And protection. So, but for your life, the anxious dragon, uh, if that's one of your dragons, you can actually find out your dragons. We have a new questionnaire online, knowyourdragons.com. It's when you felt afraid, if your childhood was scary, um, like I was beaten up virtually every day of my life until I was seven. And so it was scary. Um, if your childhood was unpredictable, you certainly know about this. Scary, unpredictable. <laughs> Felt the world was dangerous. Felt the world was dangerous. One of your early memories is your uncle being murdered and a drug deal. Gone yeah, my wrong. first three memories almost drowning, being left alone and having no idea where an adult was when I was two and a half, and my uncle being murdered. First three memories I can remember. Or if you had undependable or unpredictable. Uh, caregivers. Mm -hmm. And you actually had a babysitter that was pretty abusive. I had two that were very abusive, but I can remember. I mean, best case scenario was I remember a couple that were just didn't really pay attention and care. That was much better. But I had two that were abusive. And when you were nine, we'll we'll talk about how this dragon reacts, but you, you actually had a panic disorder. Uh, Which I never knew. When when you told me that, I was like, really? I mean, I think some people don't even realize it when, you know, like you told me I didn't believe that either. But um, but I think when we we just we learn to live with these behaviors and these things that go on in our lives and these patterns. And I think when people don't know, it's like you finally put a name to it. It's like, oh, now I can do something about it. But I didn't even realize that. That's what was happening, you know? And so what triggers this again to breathe fire on you, um, pandemic will certainly do it, societal disruption, mm-hmm. the political divide, but it's really any reminders of past fears and anxieties. Mm-hmm. And so if, like, for example, I talked in the book and I never talked about it publicly, when I was young, I used to wet my bed and every morning I woke up panic, yeah, panic yeah. because you just never knew. And well, and you had a bunch of siblings and so that. Oh, and no one else had this issue. And so I was special in that way. Um, and I remember the urologist. So my mom tried to get me help. 
he basically said, make him drink a lot of water and then make him hold it. Oh my gosh. And it was torture. I just, I just, I still remember how upset that, that made me feel. I was like chronically in pain. And so as a child psychiatrist, I'm actually really good at treating aneurysis or bedwetting. And it's a little hormone you give people called DDAVP that helps. And it's like, my goodness. Um, But so anything that reminds you of, oh my goodness, somebody will find me out that can drive anxiety. So what are your triggers Mm -hmm. and how does it cause you to react? Panic attacks, fears, phobias, predicting the worst, nervousness, insomnia, headaches, trouble breathing, worrying about being safe. Mm -hmm. And what we see on scans is their limbic or emotional brain works too hard. Mm -hmm. It's like it gets reset. So we call it limbic hyperactivity. And the treatment is to calm it down. Mm And um, you can do it with diaphragmatic breathing. I teach my patient three seconds in, six seconds out. If you take twice as long to breathe out as you breathe in, it'll actually trigger a parasympathetic or relaxation response. I mean, it's like super simple. Just do that 10 times. It's actually one of the things I do a lot that just sort of settle things down. Right. Um, meditation, which you do a lot and you find it incredibly yeah. helpful. Um, hypnosis. Uh, it's why I gravitated toward hypnosis when I was a young psychiatrist. I took a month elective in it and I just always felt calmer. Yeah. So and you actually did um, scans and studies on people praying and meditating. I think of them very similarly. Um, but you, you've done studies on them and it actually does settle down the emotional brain. And it activates the thoughtful Mm -hmm. brain, which is sort of like the perfect balancing act. Um, now with all the dragons, there are good things about the anxious dragon. If you have low levels of anxiety, you actually die early Mm -hmm. from accidents and preventable illnesses. Um, I was talking yesterday about the movie Free Solo, who is this guy that climbed Half Dome. Oh, yeah. Uh, And his anxiety center, the amygdala, he had no activity there. Oh, interesting. So he had no fear. Oh, interesting. Which is why I could do that. For me, not in your lifetime am I going to climb the black face of okay, half dome but, but there, see, the funny thing is i have a lot of anxiety over certain things especially um childhood triggers from things that felt unsafe to me and it's part of what whenever i feel that anxiety i want to challenge myself to do it to get over the fear so i mean anxiety can drive you to do those things too it's like no i need to overcome this fear well one of my patients actually the opening story in your brain is always listening uh Jimmy, his father was the leader of the Mexican mafia. And he had this term, test your metal. Right. Test. And that's kind of me. Like, I don't want it to rule me. So it's like, I want to, I want to challenge it. I know that there are a lot of people who do that. Um, For each of the dragons. um, Oh, you can also use your five senses to calm your um, limbic hyperactivity. So whether it's music uh, to settle things down, lavender as your sense of smell, massage, nature is a nutmeg of all things helps to decrease anxiety. The movies, the anxious dragons like, well, they hate horror movies. I, I despise horror movies. My mother used to take me to see horror movies when I was like a little kid. I never, I still to this day, why would you take a nine-year-old to see Hills Have Eyes? Especially when I already had a panic disorder. So to this day, I despise. Um, They tend to love funny, uplifting movies like Mrs. Doubtfire, Big uh, Chef of Love Chef, or the Disney movie 
Pollyanna. Oh my gosh. If I have to watch Pollyanna one more time, everyone in the house has boycotted Pollyanna. You have to do it. If you're new to my family, yeah, you but have to you watch don't it. need to watch it over and over and over. <laughs> <laughs> and then the affirmations uh, to say, if you have the anxious dragon, I am safe. I am secure. I am calm. I am protected. I focus on my breathing and centering myself. So, um, Odds one thing are, I tell myself, COVID, you have the anxious dragon. So one thing I tell myself when I don't feel those things is I've got this, I've got this. It's like, okay, I've got this, you know? So I'll, I'll, uh, so it's one of the reasons I take Chloe out and we do like survival training where you like sleep out in the wilderness and build your own shelter and stuff like that, because it scares me. Right. So, because it's like, this happened. What if I ever had to do this? What if, you know, like I always have these thoughts in my head and I'm afraid of sleeping out in the wilderness. So I myself do that. And it's like the whole time I was, I couldn't do well. And I'm like, okay, I've got this. You've got this. Like you, like, I just keep telling myself that. And yeah, no, I did that in the army for 10 years. <laughs> so I'm not yeah. Kidding. But I didn't have army. Me. It was just <laughs> Chloe. All right. What did you learn? Do you have the anxious dragon? Write it down, post it on any of your social media sites. Uh, and I really love if you would, Free or order if you're listening to this after the book is out, March 2nd, copy of your brain is always listening. If you go to your brain is always listening.com and you pre-order the book, you can actually download some really great gifts, including a coupon for a free bottle of happy saffron. Stay with us. Your brain is always listening. I am thrilled to be your guide and show you how to tame your dragons so that you can have the happiness, peace, and the relationships you deserve. Welcome back. We are talking about dragons and your brain is always listening. I love this book. I think the dragons are so much fun. Um, we're going to talk about the wounded dragon today. But before we do, I want to read a review. So this is from Family Therapist Unplugged by Quincy Rose. This podcast has tran transformed not only me personally, but also my outlook on my mental health and physical disability, which has therefore revolutionized my practice as a family therapist. I realized that I can help many people view their insecurities as a strength. If they can actually view, if I can actually view my own most crippling insecurity as a strength. I've had three traumatic brain injuries before the age of 19, which has led to focus impairments as well as challenges walking. The Amon's approach to understanding the function of every change or difference in our brain and body is what started the process of viewing myself in the world differently. I love that. And I don't like the word disability, just FYI. I like other abled because we've got Natalie, who is our social media coordinator and she's a quadriplegic. She um, was injured in a skiing accident when she was 15. And I think of her as anything but disabled. That girl, I think she could like, she could take over the world. So I do not think of her as disabled. She's, she actually is taking over the right. world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's change that word to other abled if we could. Well, so in your brain is always listening. Dearly love if you pre-ordered the book, uh, bought it as a gift. It's a great gift to help people know their dragons. You can go to your brain is always listening.com. Um, and you can find out your dragons at knowyourdragons.com. Uh, the dragons are going to be a big part of this podcast going forward. Um, today, we're going to talk about another very common dragon. It's called the wounded dragon. Hold it up closer. Yeah, he's cute. He's sad, though. He's like hurt. And the wounded dragon is the trauma dragon. Its origins are if you experienced trauma, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, intense stress, such as being in a fire flood, uh, being assaulted, being in an earthquake. I was um, in two earthquakes, uh, being bullied, being teased, uh, being picked on. Um, that often 
is the origin. And I know you've had a couple of traumatic incidences from the assault when you were 15, where you were attacked by a guy in a suit on the way to school, who sexually assaulted you, your stepfather, who um, did his best to sexually molest you. Um, and uh, growing up with that intense stress mm -hmm. is traumatic. You know, there's something about this word trauma. And I, I, di I didn't think about, I mean, I knew for myself, I hated the word trauma. It's like traumatized. Like I'm not like that word is so dramatic. Like I don't, I'm not traumatized. Um, and I, I couldn't really acknowledge it. Um, for the longest time. And I, and I realized that a lot of people who follow us and leave me comments feel the same way. It's like, ugh, that word is so dramatic. But really what trauma means, I, I, I love the definition I found. Uh, one of the definitions is it's really just any extreme situation that makes you feel like the world is unsafe. It ruins your trust in the world or in people. Um, it sort of shakes you to the core as far, and it makes you feel like you just can't trust. Um, and it causes these repetitive thoughts, you know, of always looking for what's wrong, paying attention, causes anxiety. So that's really what trauma is. So if we could just like get past this idea of, oh, I was traumatized because it makes you feel like a victim. Well, and it's not the same as being a victim. Right. I mean, you were. So being a victimized victim. is different for me than being a victim. I do not think of myself as a victim. Well, you don't have to own it. Right. Right. Too many people own being a victim. Right. And. Being victimized does not mean you need to live your life. In 35 the years ago, I wrote a course called The Sabotage Factor about all the ways we sabotage ourselves from getting what we want in life. And the number one hallmark of uh, the sabotage factor was blaming other people mm -hmm. for how your life is turning out. And um, blame is just not helpful to see yourself. Uh, as a victim, but yet a lot of us have experienced intense, prolonged trauma. Right. And what triggers this dragon is any past reminder. Um, it can be smells, sights, sounds, anniversaries. Like my dad died in May last year. He and I used to work out every Sunday. And so Every Sunday, I think about him and I get sad. Um, now, we'll talk more about the grief and loss dragon um, in a couple of weeks. But it's anything that reminds us. Um, and growing up when I was a teenager, I love Cat Stevens. He's just one of my favorite <laughs> musical artists. We're doing artists. this again. And whenever I play him, if Tana's in earshot, I, like, I, I get in the shower and put him on and mm. she comes in the bathroom, she turns him off, yells at me. No, because you know, <laughs> you know, there are certain songs I cannot listen right, to. Right, but I was by myself and you just... But sometimes you do it just to see, like, I know he does it just to get the reaction. He wants to see if he can... You're trying to like give me shock therapy or something and get me through it <laughs> because I don't hear the music with certain songs. <clears throat> I relive the memories. And so I hear the memories of what happened many years ago. And so it's like nails on a chalkboard. Right. Because what was a good time for me was, was a, a terrible time. time for you. Right. So how do people react when the wounded dragon breathes fire on their emotional brain? They can relive the trauma, just like you said. They can have flashbacks, nightmares, feel numb, avoid situations or music that reminds them of the event. They can startle easily, feel that their future is shortened, and just start watching for bad things happen. Now, um, what's the upside? of having the wounded dragon. Well, you end up with a book like yours, The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child, mm -hmm. that um, has a lot of great reviews. I mean, none of my books have 4.9 out of five star <laughs> reviews. Um, and you can develop something that we call post-traumatic growth, where you have spiritual changes. Your life 
mean something more to you. You see new possibilities. You appreciate life more. You begin to relate to others in a more meaningful way. Um, and it really, I think for you, I love this kickstart greatness, mm -hmm. right? When you embrace it, when you talk about it, when we first met, you weren't talking about any of this. I thought it was stuff. all nonsense. Psychobabble, don't talk to me about this. <laughs> keep the facade up, keep the mask up. Work in a trauma unit, deal with blood and guts and no walkie talkies. <laughs> like, we're not doing this. <laughs> Why are you watching like that? Okay. You kept wanting to talk about it. I'm like, nope. But you kept coming back. That's <laughs> all I can say. Um, so in taming the wounded dragon, um, think about post-traumatic growth. How has that trauma made your life better? EMDR, very specific Love treatment EMDR. for trauma that stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. They're bridging where I have you bring up the thoughts and feelings around the trauma and then take you back to the first time that happened, just to begin to clean it up. So you're not thinking like a four-year-old that you're thinking like an adult who is soothing mm -hmm. the four-year-old. Um, there's a technique called havening that mm -hmm. we have talked about that um, you can learn more about. I think journaling the story of the event. And that's what you did in the relentless courage yeah. of a scared child. And that and was not just journaling, you, right? but actually interviewing people and making sure I had the details. Right. And the interesting thing was watching my family actually fight over it. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun <laughs> because all of them had different, you know, recollections of how it happened. It was so interesting to see. You do not have to be your past. You can tame the wounded dragon and um, take the best part of it, move beyond. So one thing I love about this, you know, after I've done all of these, like everything you just said, and I <laughs> love them all. Once I just started this journey, you started calling me a seeker because once I opened the door, I'm like, all right, I'm a very intense person. So once I opened the door, really? yeah. I don't think they've noticed A little that. bit. <laughs> so once I opened that door, I'm like, we're doing it. If we're doing it, we're doing it all. And so like, I don't, I don't do small baby steps. I tend to jump canyons. So I'm like, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do everything I can get my hands on. And we're going to like just dive headfirst into all of this once I opened it. So one thing that I, that I really love though, I like this idea of post-traumatic growth because I would not go back and change it if I could. And that's an interesting thing to be able to say now, because at one time in my life, I would have, I would have told you, oh my God, if I could just go back and change it all, I would not go back and change it. I would not want to be cured, but to be whole, to be fixed, to be mended, that's different. Because now I feel like I've got so much more depth, history, each one of those breaks, each one of those mends, each one of those, you know, repairs makes me a stronger person, makes me a more whole makes person. Makes you who you are. Makes me who I am, makes me more able to um, help other people. And for the most part, you like who And you so are. for everyone listening- I like who you are. Right, and so for everyone listening, it's like, would you really change it? Or do you just want to be healed? Do you want to be whole again? So what kind of movies does the wounded dragon like? Um, healing movies. Um, like Goodwill Hunting. It's great. Or a beautiful mind. Mm -hmm. Lion King. Um, I love Lion King. Ray, uh, about Ray Charles, and as good as it gets. Yep. And the meditations for the wounded dragon um, are I am safe in this moment. I have everything I need in this moment. That was then, this is now. I release trauma, turmoil, and grief. Asking for help is a sign of strength. Mm. Asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the wounded dragon. Your brain is always listening. You can get it, uh, get all sorts of wonderful gifts, including six hypnosis audios mm -hmm. with it 
a special event for two hours where I answer questions from just people who pre-ordered the book on um, March 17th. So if you're listening to it afterwards, uh, I'm sorry. Um, but also a uh, coupon for a free bottle of Happy Saffron. We are just, uh, have already given away hundreds of bottles oh, of Happy awesome. Saffron, which is one of my favorite supplements. Your brain is always listening.com. Stay with us. At Aben Clinics, we're creating a revolution in psychiatry. All other medical specialists look at the organ they treat before they treat it, but most psychiatrists never look and end up guessing based on whatever symptoms you tell them. But how do you know unless you look? Brain SPECT imaging gives us a new way to look at your brain to understand and treat your symptoms so you can ultimately know what is going on and feel better. Welcome back. Today, we're gonna to talk about another one of my dragons, the should and shaming dragons. You're listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. We are doing this multiple week series on my new book, Your Brain is Always Listening. Dearly loved, you ordered it, give it away to 10 of your friends. They'll love mm. it, it's practical, it's fun. Um, it really allows you to spend like if you did a year of therapy with me, what would be the big lessons you would learn? And the first thing we do is identify your dragons. So we are grateful you're with us. You have. So I have a review before we get started. A note of appreciation to Dr. Amen and to all of you for the very kind, caring and compassionate work that you do every single day. May we all continue to work together to change the conversation, methods and models for understanding mental health and neurological wellness in our nation and all over the world. Thank you so very much. That's from Junie F. Awesome. Well, awesome. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about the shouldn't shaming dragon. I know this dragon really well. Um, and you know, I think if you grow up Catholic like I did or Jewish or Asian or there's so right. Russian, you know, that uh, many people use this dragon to manipulate. But, but most parents even, especially, especially parents who have already like sort of suffered themselves and figured out how to stop suffering or gone through trauma. Like I know even as a parent, I have to leash this dragon all the time because I want to spare my daughter the pain that I've been through. Right. Um, one of the things that really helped me with this dragon was love and logic. Um, love and logic parenting, because when I, when this dragon starts to get out of control and I want to tell my daughter, you should, you should, you should, it's like, I have to remind myself, should she really like, she needs to figure this out. You're shooting all over her. Shooting all over her. And that, that program really helped me. So the origin of this dragon is if you're raised in a shame based culture, mm -hmm. um, where if you don't do a certain thing, people tell you you're going to hell. I mean, the whole eternal <laughs> like, damnation. Like you when you were seven? <laughs> yeah, no, or I was six. six or seven and I told a lie. At least my mom said I told a lie. I actually have no recollection of this. But what I do re recall is her starting to cry and then saying, I never thought I would have a son who's going <laughs> to hell. Imagine what that does to the psyche of a six or seven year old child. Um, it's not good. Um, the origin of this dragon is past humiliation. If you've been embarrassed or belittled, judged or criticized mm -hmm. by yourself or by other people. And this dragon is triggered um in fact let me show you this dragon he is super cute for those of you watching um i know i love the i love the graphics the dragons are so cute 
it's triggered by disapproval from someone important, such as a spouse, a boss, um, a coworker, or a parent, even if you're 52 and your mother disapproves of you, um, or you have perceived disapproval from a higher power. And the reactions are feeling guilt, foolish, distressed, exposed, wanting to hide or withdraw, overly sensitive, and I've certainly been sensitive over the years, overly submissive, that's definitely not your problem. But the shaming dragon, up until I decided to get help, we talked about the wounded dragon. The, the shaming dragon, the shouldn't shaming dragon, I think ruled my life up until I decided to actually get help for the wounded dragon. So because in, because as long as I was hiding from all of those things, um, those wounds, I didn't want to deal with those wounds. The shame that goes along with so much stuff, even stuff that you don't have control over as a child. There's so much shame around some of those thoughts and feelings. Um, it just will paralyze you. It's so many, so many people feel paralyzed by this one. Well, and this dragon can lead to self-harming behaviors, uh, addictions, pornography, overeating, cutting, eating disorders, eating disorders. Um, and it really provides the seeds for anxiety, depression, and obsessive mm -hmm. thinking. Um, now, there are upsides to all of these dragons. And the upside to the shouldn't shaming dragon is there are things you should do. And there are things you should be ashamed of if you do. Right. So, so discernment. So we can use it for discernment. is important. Society does need rules. Parents should take care of their children. And you shouldn't hurt people. So it's really the balance. Of course, there are things that you should and shouldn't do. The idea is trying to motivate behavior with guilt is generally just not helpful. And uh, so, as you said, using discernment on does my behavior get me what well, I and, want? And that goes to something deeper, which you're going to end up talking about later, which is values. Making sure your values are in alignment. Values <clears throat> are so critical. Um, so... And uh, in the book, Finding the Upside, of course, there are things you shouldn't, shouldn't do. Morality is essential for the greater good. That's why we have rules and laws. Shame and guilt can be helpful if their emotions serve your life goals, but they can hurt you if they make you feel bad, small, or disconnected from others. Shame can motivate learning, growth, and desire to change to be better. Um, so, so. Um, one of the strategies that I love, I think it's one of the most important strategies I give my patients, is replace I should in your head with I want to. Right. This is going to get me what I want. Or it fits my goals to and see if it still mm -hmm. fits. Like I would get the thought I should go see my dad or now I should go see my mom. And whenever you, you try to motivate behavior with guilt, it makes you feel bad. And so you don't go visit your dad or you don't go visit mm -hmm. your mom. But when I replace that I should with I want to, or it fits my goals to, then I would go see them because I both wanted to and it fit my goals to. So know when guilt is helpful and when it's not, behavior is way more complicated than people think. See your young self love and compact and i think therapy really helps with that how would a loving parent treat him or her mm -hmm. um and then talk to someone about the shame you feel hiding from it expands yes. it yes facing it takes away its power mm -hmm. um Movies for the should and shaming dragon. There are movies that poke fun at tradition, like MASH, one of my favorite movies ever, or Meet the Parents, Meet the parents. or The Help. I love us. The Help. That was so a great funny. movie. 
and the affirmations to say or meditate on every day um, for the should and shaming dragons is each day I feel more at peace with my mistakes. I work to learn the lessons of my past. I can and will let go of any shame that haunts me. I replace, I should do this with, does it fit my overall goals to do this? Mm. That was then. This is now. So do you have some of the shouldn't shaming dragons? Very important to tame this dragon. That was one of the, that, that dragon is probably one of the cornerstones of, of my book. Just when you hold it in, when you try it, like putting on a facade, try not to let anybody see there's so much shame, but that just makes the shame build and build and build until you just, it, the weight is so heavy. Yeah. Makes me think of the phrase, the shame that binds you. Mm -hmm. And it's just so true. So what did you learn today? Write it down, post it on any of your social media sites, hashtag brain warriors way podcast. Also hashtag your brain is always listening. You can go to your brain is always listening.com. If you pre-order the book or order the book, you can download some very special gifts we have for you. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are fully engaged with the dragons. Um, today, we're going to talk about the special, spoiled, and entitled dragons. Um, boy, do we see a lot of this just in society these days, and um, I'm super interested in talking about this. But before we do, please um, let us know what you have learned at the end of this. Um, take a screenshot, tag us. We love to answer questions. Um, this is really important to us. We would love if you would leave us a review. You can go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com <clears throat> or you can leave a review on Apple or Stitcher or wherever you listen from, whatever platform. And we would be so grateful and we'll try not to act special, spoiled, or entitled. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very common dragon and people don't ever want to admit that they have this dragon but it lives in a lot of us and it causes such well, stress. And there's a myth. There's this myth that it's, it's um, relegated only to certain socioeconomic statuses. Not true. Um, this is, this pervades pretty much, it crosses all races, um, socioeconomics. It's, it's really more about your attitude about what you deserve in life and who owes you. So the origin of a special spoiled or entitled dragon is if you were the golden child. Mm -hmm. Say your parents couldn't have children mm. and you're an IVF baby uh, in vitro fertilization. And you grow up always hearing about how you were a miracle. If you're a miracle baby, if, you know, your parents... Um, and, and I know for you, you actually tried to have Chloe for a while. Yeah. And I thought I couldn't have kids. You thought, and then you could. And so they become so special. If you're the oldest, if you're the youngest. Um, and let, let's be clear. It's okay to make your kids feel super special as long as you also don't make them think that, that as long as they also learn responsibility and like the world doesn't owe them something. Right. Well, and the favor child um I, i'm middle eastern so i'm just gonna say it we see this a lot in our culture <laughs> i certainly saw it in my family well and i did too 
you know, given I was the second son, my older brother, the oldest uh, boy, uh, was clearly the golden child. Right. And so my mom was actually the opposite of favored. She was totally not special because she was the only girl. Which is interesting because she worked. She was the one who worked the hardest. And I was totally not special. And I am probably the hardest worker. Right. So my mother, my mother, it was so interesting. My grandmother would just, she was constantly putting her down, which I thought was super interesting. My mother has not only worked the hardest, she is by far, not even by a little, the most successful, even though she started with the least. And all she ever heard, I remember growing up always hearing, you know, you not like you, you not like the boys, you not like the, I mean, she was just constantly coming down on her for not like, being like the boys. She was mad at her for not finding a man to take care of her. Like there was, she couldn't do anything right. It was very interesting. Um, the pop stars I've seen mm. because the idol people worship. treated them as if they were special. Idol worship. And so um, not all of them, some of them I've seen have just been amazing. But like they just wouldn't show up for their appointment or right. they'd show up four hours late and expect you to just drop everything right. and still see them. So what triggers uh, this dragon when you don't get your way? When others try to make you take responsibility, when you don't feel as though you are not treated as special? Mm -hmm. um, now I have a couple of family members that fall into this and, um, and it has nothing to do with socioeconomics. Let me tell you, it has to do with you, like the world owes me and you should be taking care of me just because so. And yeah, you wonder where, because I exist that came from it's, they try to deflect responsibility, yeah, zero responsibility. And so. Um, how this dragon causes you to react is you have low empathy. You're not thinking about things from the other person's point of view. Other people don't matter. And so it's easy to cut them off. Um, tantrums, rudeness, needing attention, a sense of injustice, outrage. You owe me. You know who I'm thinking about. <laughs> I deserve. It's their fault. Right. This dragon causes all sorts of trouble. Um, there's not much upside on no. this dragon. Because, it, because you can scream those things all day long and all the only person that it hurts is you. So you might feel like they owe you, the world owes you, it's their fault. Guess what? It's not hurting them, it's hurting you. You know, what I wrote in the book is feeling special and having a cheering section can help your self-esteem as long as you don't get a big head. As long as you balance and, it. And um, use it against other people. As long as you balance it with responsibility. Yeah. You well, know, sometimes personal, personal ownership. And, and sometimes I have this dragon. You know, it's like, well, I'm special. And, you know, I've done all of these really cool things. So what I've really had to tame it. So if somebody asks me to speak at a big event, I want to be humble and not go. You don't. Love you that. should treat me. Better. No, I would not live well with someone like that. You do not live. there. I would <laughs> not live well with someone like that. You may have those thoughts, but you do not behave that way. You do not live your life that way. Because we would not be together if you did. <laughs> Um, so how do you tame this dragon? If you recognize some of yourself, take responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I always love what you've taught me. Responsibility is not about blame. It's just about your ability mm -hmm. to respond in the situation. And take ownership. Work to promote the success of others. And, you know, that's what good leaders do. They don't have to go, me, 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 me. I did this, I did that. You know, if you're like that, that usually means you're struggling with the abandoned, invisible, or insignificant dragon. But promoting the success of others um, helps to tame this I think dragon. that's a sign of maturity as well. Because I think a lot of times we have that, when I certainly did when I was younger. But then you, 
once we sort of grasp this idea that a rising tide floats all boats, it's like when my team does better, I do better. When my kids do better, I do better. If my parents do better, you know, you start to think a rising tide floats all boats if you can change that paradigm a little bit. Um, catch yourself justifying your spoiled actions um, like your tantrums um, and ask, what can I do to make this better? Your marriage will be so much better. Your relationships at work will be so much better if you just go, what is it I can do this better? I, I do an exercise with um, the kids and parents I see and the couples I see. And that is, I often start with, what do you do that makes yeah. your wife angry? Or what do you do that makes your mother crazy? And nothing. And I know they're lying to me. And when I get them to think about what we do that makes the situation worse, then I go, what do you do that makes it better? Just to show them, teach them you have a place. I mean, I clearly could make you very Yeah, if you have to like that, quickly. you could. <laughs> and I can make the, I right. know, because I've been in tension for 50 years, and that gives me a sense of power. Right. Uh, can I get what I want by acting in a certain way? And what I want is good. I want to have a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship with you. And when I feel powerful, when I feel like, well, I can make it better, or I can make it worse, but I choose to make it better. That helps us. Yeah. One thing I learned, I love this um, from our friend, Joseph McClendon. It's like, rather than like, rather than using statements like, I, you know, this is, this just happened to me. They did this to me. Switch it around, look in the mirror and go, what is my opportunity here? What's the opportunity for me to do something? You instantly now have taken control of it. You're empowered. Um, the movies, the special spoiled and entitled dragons like Cruel Intentions, yeah. The Wolf of Wall Street, Devil Loves Prada, 10 Things That I Hate About You, Mean Girls, The O.C., Beverly Hills Housewives, Housewives of Beverly oh, Hills, Housewives really of any city, oh. Affirmations to Calm, the special spoiled or entitled dragons, I am special but so is everyone else around right. me. I am responsible for my own happiness. I encourage the success of others. I see things from other person's point of view, acting spoiled, spoils my own happiness and joy. Oh boy. I was just thinking, I wonder if I've given our daughter Chloe um, a complex because you remember when she was little and she'd come in, it's not fair. And she'd do the whole, you know, storming in. And I would look at her and go, life's not fair. I don't know who ever told you life was going to be fair. Fair is a place with bad food and farm animals. What are you going to do to make it better? I probably gave her one of these dragons by doing that. <laughs> Which one do I, yeah, probably. <laughs> well, but she has to be very careful not to be the special spoiled right. and entitled dragon because she, because she's growing up. She's in, your only child, and she has a very charmed life. So you know we do have to be careful with that. So I've always tried to put the responsibility back on her. So and she's growing up to be a wonderful human being. But it just occurred to me. But this dragon can pop its head up periodically. Oh, yeah. Uh, but with all of us, it can. So what did you learn? Write it down. Post it on any of your social media sites. Uh, I would dearly love if you got a copy of Your Brain is Always Listening. You can go to Your Brain is Always Listening. It'll teach you, you know, how to pre-order, order the book, and then how you can download the gifts we have for you. And this book makes a great gift uh, that uh, it'll just benefit so many people. You can also find out what your dragons are by go to knowyourdragons.com. Stay with us. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're interested in coming to Amen Clinics, use the code 
podcast 10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com. For more information, give us a call at 855-978-1363.